Book Three, Chapter Four of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Three, Chapter Four. The Stream of Love Runs On. Whither? Days are like years in the love of the young, when no bar, no obstacle is between their hearts, when the sun shines and the course runs smooth, when their love is prosperous and confessed. Ione no longer concealed from Glaucus the attachment she felt for him, and their talk now was only of their love. Over the rapture of the present, the hopes of the future glowed like the heaven above the gardens of spring. When they went in their trustful thoughts far down the stream of time, they laid out the chart of their destiny to come. They suffered the light of today to suffuse the morrow. In the youth of their hearts it seemed as if care and change and death were as things unknown. Perhaps they loved each other the more because the condition of the world left to Glaucus no aim and no wish but love, because the distractions common in free states to men's affections existed not for the Athenian because his country wooed him not to the bustle of civil life, because ambition furnished no counterpoise to love, and, therefore, over their schemes and projects, love only reigned. In the Iron Age they imagined themselves of the golden, doomed only to live and to love. To the superficial observer, who interests himself only in characters strongly marked and broadly colored, both the lovers may seem of too slight and commonplace a mold, in the delineation of characters purposely subdued, the reader sometimes imagines that there is a want of character. Perhaps, indeed, I wrong the real nature of these two lovers by not painting more impressively their stronger individualities. But in dwelling so much on their bright and bird-like existence, I am influenced almost insensibly by the forethought of the changes that await them, and for which they are so ill-prepared. It was this very softness and gaiety of life that contrasted most strongly the vicissitudes of their coming fate, for the oak without fruit or blossom, whose hard and rugged heart is fitted for the storm, there is less fear than for the delicate branches of the myrtle and the laughing clusters of the vine. They now advanced far into August. The next month their marriage was fixed, and the threshold of Glaucus was already wreathed with garlands and nightly, by the door of Ione, he poured forth the rich libations. He existed no longer for his gay companions, he was ever with Ione. In the mornings they beguiled the sun with music, in the evenings they forsook the crowded haunts of the gay for excursions on the water, or along the fertile and vine-clad plains that lay beneath the fatal mount of Vesuvius. The earth shook no more, the lively Pompeians forgot even that there had gone forth so terrible a warning of their approaching doom. Glaucus imagined that convulsion, in the vanity of his heathen religion, and a special interposition of the gods, less in behalf of his own safety than that of Ione. He offered up the sacrifices of gratitude at the temples of his faith, and even the altar of Isis was covered with his votive garlands. As to the prodigy of the animated marble, he blushed at the effect it had produced on him. He believed it, indeed, to have been wrought by the magic of men, but the result convinced him that it betokened not the anger of a goddess. Of Arbaces they heard only that he still lived, stretched on the bed of suffering. He recovered slowly from the effect of the shock he had sustained. He left the lovers unmolested, but it was only to brood over the hour and the method of revenge. Alike in their mornings at the house of Ione, and in their evening excursions, Nydia was usually their constant, and often their sole companion. They did not guess the secret fires which consumed her, the abrupt freedom with which she mingled in their conversation. Her capricious and often her peevish moods found already indulgence in the recollection of the service they owed her, and their compassion for her affliction. They felt an interest in her, perhaps the greater and more affectionate from the very strangeness and waywardness of her nature, her singular alternations of passion and softness, the mixture of ignorance and genius, of delicacy and rudeness, of the quick humors of the child, and the proud calmness of the woman. Although she refused to accept of freedom, she constantly suffered to be free, 
she went where she listed no curb was put either on her words or actions they felt for one so darkly faded and so susceptible of every wound the same pitying and compliant indulgence the mother feels for a spoiled and sickly child dreading to impose authority even where they imagined it for her benefit she availed herself of this license by refusing the companionship of the slave whom they wished to attend her with the slender staff by which she guided her steps she went now as in her former unprotected state along the populous streets it was almost miraculous to perceive how quickly and how dexterously she threaded every crowd avoiding every danger and could find her benighted way through the most intricate windings of the city but her chief delight was still in visiting the few feet of ground which made the garden of glaucus intending the flowers that at least repaid her love sometimes she entered the chamber where he sat and sought a conversation which she nearly always broke off abruptly for conversation with glaucus only tended to one subject ione and that name from his lips inflicted agony upon her often she bitterly repented the service she had rendered to ione often she said inly if she had fallen glaucus could have loved her no longer and then dark and fearful thoughts crept into her breast she had not experienced fully the trials that were in store for her when she had been thus generous she had never before been present when glaucus and ione were together she had never heard that voice so kind to her so much softer to another the shock that crushed her heart with the tidings that glaucus loved had at first only saddened and benumbed by degrees jealousy took a wilder and fiercer shape it partook of hatred it whispered revenge as you see the wind only agitate the green leaf upon the bough while the leaf which has lain withered and seared on the ground bruised and trampled upon till the sap and life are gone is suddenly whirled aloft now here now there without stay and without rest so the love which visits the happy and the hopeful hath but freshness on its wings its violence is but sportive but the heart that hath fallen from the green things of life that is without hope that hath no summer in its fibres is torn and whirled by the same wind that but caresses its brethren it hath no bough to cling to it is dashed from path to path till the winds fall and it is crushed into the mire for ever the friendless childhood of nydia had hardened prematurely her character perhaps the heated scenes of profligation through which she had passed seemingly unscathed had ripened her passions though they had not sullied her purity the orgies of burbo might only have disgusted the banquets of the egyptian might only have terrified at the moment but the winds that pass unheeded over the soil leave seeds behind them as darkness too favors the imagination so perhaps her very blindness contributed to feed with wild and delirious visions the love of the unfortunate girl the voice of glaucus had been the first that had sounded musically to her ear his kindness had made an impression upon her mind when he had left pompeii in the former year she had treasured up in her heart every word he had uttered and when any one told her that this friend and patron of the poor flower girl was the most brilliant and the most graceful of the young revellers of pompeii she had felt a pleasing pride in nursing his recollection even the task which she imposed upon herself of tending his flowers served to keep him in her mind she associated him with all that was most charming to her impressions and when she had refused to express that image she fancied ione to resemble it was partly because that whatever was bright and soft in nature she had already combined with the thought of glaucus if any of my readers ever loved at an age which they would smile to remember an age in which fancy forestalled the reason let them say whether that love among all its strange and complicated delicacies was not above all other and later passions susceptible of jealousy i seek not here the cause i know that it is commonly the fact when glaucus returned to pompeii nydia had told another year of life that year with its sorrows its loneliness its trials had greatly developed her mind and heart and when the athenian drew her unconsciously to his breast deeming her still in soul as in years a child when he kissed her smooth cheek and wound his arm round her trembling frame 
Nydia felt suddenly, as by revelation, that those feelings she had long and innocently cherished were of love, doomed to be rescued from tyranny by Glaucus, doomed to take shelter under his roof, doomed to breathe, but for so brief a time, the same air, and doomed, in the first rush of a thousand happy, grateful, delicious sentiments of an overflowing heart, to hear that he loved another, to be commissioned to that other, the messenger, the minister, to feel all at once that utter nothingness which she was, which she ever must be, but which, till then, her young mind had not taught her, that utter nothingness to him who was all to her. What wonder that, in her wild and passionate soul, all the elements jarred discordant, that if love reigned over the whole, it was not the love which is born of the more sacred and soft emotions. Sometimes she dreaded only lest Glaucus should discover her secret. Sometimes she felt indignant that it was not suspected. It was a sign of contempt. Could he imagine that she presumed so far? Her feelings to Ione ebbed and flowed with every hour. Now she loved her because he did. Now she hated him for the same cause. There were moments when she could have murdered her unconscious mistress moments when she could have laid down life for her these fierce and tremulous alternations of passion were too severe to be borne long her health gave way though she felt it not her cheek paled her step grew feebler tears came to her eyes more often and relieved her less one morning when she repaired to her usual task in the garden of the athenian she found glaucus under the columns of the peristyle with a merchant of the town he was selecting jewels for his destined bride. He had already fitted up her apartment. The jewels he bought that day were placed also within it. They were never fated to grace the fair form of Ione. They may be seen at this day among the disinterred treasures of Pompeii, in the chambers of the studio at Naples. Come hither, Nydia, put down thy vase, and come hither. Thou must take this chain from me. Stay. There, I have put it on. There, Sir Villius, does it not become her? Wonderfully, answered the jeweler, for jewelers were well-bred and flattering men, even at that day. But when these earrings glitter in the ears of the noble Ione, then, by Bacchus, you will see whether my art adds anything to beauty. Ione, repeated Nydia, who had hitherto acknowledged by smiles and blushes the gift of Glaucus. Yes, replied the Athenian, carelessly toying with the gems, I am choosing a present for Ione, but there are none worthy of her. He was startled as he spoke by an abrupt gesture of Nydia. She tore the chain violently from her neck and dashed it on the ground. How is this? What, Nydia, dost thou not like the bauble? Art thou offended? You treat me ever as a slave and as a child, replied the Thessalian, with ill-suppressed sobs, and she turned hastily away to the opposite corner of the garden. Glaucus did not attempt to follow, or to soothe. He was offended. He continued to examine the jewels and to comment on their fashion, to object to this and to praise that, and finally to be talked by the merchant into buying all, the safest plan for a lover, and a plan that any one will do right to adopt, provided always that he can obtain an Ione. When he had completed his purchase and dismissed the jeweler, he retired into his chamber, dressed, mounted his chariot, and went to Ione. He thought no more of the blind girl, or her offense. He had forgotten both the one and the other. He spent the forenoon with his beautiful Neapolitan, repaired thence to the baths, supped, if, as we have said before, we can justly so translate the three o'clock Kona of the Romans, alone, and abroad, for Pompeii had its restaurateurs, and returning home to change his dress, ere he again repaired to the house of Ione. He passed the peristyle, but with the absorbed reverie and absent eyes of a man in love, and did not note the form of the poor blind girl, bending exactly in the same place where he had left her. But though he saw her not, her ear recognized at once the sound of his step. She had been counting the moments to his return. He had scarcely entered his favorite chamber, which opened on the peristyle, and seated himself musingly on his couch, when he felt his robe timorously touched, and, turning, he beheld Nydia kneeling before him, and holding up to him a handful of flowers, a gentle and appropriate peace-offering. 
her eyes darkly upheld to his own streamed with tears i have offended thee she said sobbing and for the first time i would die rather than cause thee a moment's pain say that thou wilt forgive me see i have taken up the chain i have put it on i will never part from it it is thy gift my dear nydia returned glaucus and raising her he kissed her forehead think of it no more but why my child wert thou so suddenly angry i could not divine the cause do not ask she said coloring violently i am a thing full of faults and humors you know i am but a child you say so often is it from a child that you can expect a reason for every folly but prettiest you will soon be a child no more and if you would have us treat you as a woman you must learn to govern these singular impulses and gales of passion think not i chide no it is for your happiness only i speak it is true said nydia i must learn to govern myself i must bide i must suppress my heart this is a woman's task and duty methinks her virtue is hypocrisy self-control is not deceit my nydia returned the athenian and that is the virtue necessary alike to man and to woman it is the true senatorial toga the badge of the dignity it covers self-control self-control well well what you say is right when i listen to you glaucus my wildest thoughts grow calm and sweet and a delicious serenity falls over me advise ah guide me ever my preserver thy affectionate heart will be thy best guide nydia when thou hast learned to regulate its feelings ah that will be never sighed nydia wiping away her tears say not so the first effort is the only difficult one i have made many first efforts answered nydia innocently but you my mentor do you find it so easy to control yourself can you conceal can you even regulate your love for ione love dear nydia ah that is quite another matter answered the young preceptor i thought so replied nydia with a melancholy smile glaucus wilt thou take my poor flowers do with them as thou wilt thou canst give them to ione she added with a little hesitation nay nydia answered glaucus kindly divining something of jealousy in her language though he imagined it only the jealousy of a vain and susceptible child i will not give thy pretty flowers to any one sit here and weave them into a garland i will wear it this night it is not the first those delicate fingers have woven for me the poor girl delightedly sat down beside glaucus she drew from her girdle a ball of the many-colored threads or rather slender ribbons used in the weaving of garlands and which for it was her professional occupation she carried constantly with her and began quickly and gracefully to commence her task upon her young cheeks the tears had already dried a faint but happy smile played round her lips childlike indeed she was sensible only of the joy of the present hour she had reconciled to glaucus he had forgiven her she was beside him he played caressingly with her silken hair his breath fanned her cheek ione the cruel ione was not by none other demanded divided his care yes she was happy and forgetful it was one of the few moments in her brief and troubled life that it was sweet to treasure to recall as the butterfly allured by the winter sun basks for a little in the sudden light ere yet the wind awakes and the frost comes which shall blast it before the eve she rested beneath a beam which by contrast with the wonted skies was not chilling and the instinct which should have warned her of its briefness bade her only gladden in its smile thou hast beautiful locks said glaucus they were once i ween well a mother's delight nydia sighed it would seem that she had not been born a slave but she ever shunned the mention of her parentage and whether obscure or noble certain it is that her birth was never known by her benefactors nor by any one in those distant shores even to the last the child of sorrow and of mystery she came and went as some bird that enters our chamber for a moment we see it flutter for a while before us we know not whence it flew or to what region it escapes nydia sighed and after a short pause without answering the remark said but do i weave too many roses in my wreath glaucus 
they tell me it is thy favorite flower and ever favored my nydia be it by those who have the soul of poetry it is the flower of love of festival it is also the flower we dedicate to silence and to death it blooms on our brows in life while life be worth the having it is scattered above our sepulchre when we are no more ah would said nydia instead of this perishable wreath that i could take thy web from the hand of the fates and insert the roses there pretty one thy wish is worthy of a voice so attuned to song it is uttered in the spirit of song and whatever my doom i thank thee whatever thy doom is it not already destined to all things bright and fair my wish was vain the fates will be as tender to thee as i should it may not be so nydia were it not for love while youth lasts i may forget my country for a while but what athenian in his graver manhood can think of athens as she was and be contented that he is happy while she is fallen fallen and forever and why forever as ashes cannot be rekindled as love once dead can never revive so freedom departed from a people is never regained but talk we not of these matters unsuited to thee to me oh thou errest i too have my sighs for greece my cradle was rocked at the foot of olympus the gods have left the mountain but their traces may be seen seen in the hearts of their worshippers seen in the beauty of their clime they tell me it is beautiful and i have felt its airs to which even these are harsh its sun to which these skies are chill oh talk to me of greece poor fool that i am i can comprehend thee and methinks had i yet lingered on those shores had i been a grecian maid whose happy fate it was to love and to be loved i myself could have armed my lover for another marathon a new platea yes the hand that now weaves the roses should have woven thee the olive crown if such a day could come said glaucus catching the enthusiasm of the blind thessalian and half rising but no the sun has set and the night only bids us be forgetful and in forgetness be gay weave still the roses but it was with a melancholy tone of forced gaiety that the athenian uttered the last words and sinking into a gloomy reverie he was only awakened from it a few minutes afterwards by the voice of nydia as she sang in a low tone the following words which he had once taught her the apology for pleasure one who will assume the bays that the hero wore wreaths on the tomb of days gone evermore who shall disturb the brave or one leaf on their holy grave the laurel is vowed to them leave the bay on its sacred stem but this the rose the fading rose alike for slave and freeman grows two if memory sit beside the dead with tombs her only treasure if hope is lost and freedom fled the more excuse for pleasure come weave the wreath the roses weave the rose at least is ours to feeble hearts our fathers leave in pitying scorn the flowers three on the summit worn and hoary of file's solemn hill the tramp of the brave is still and still in the sadness mart the pulse of the mighty heart whose very blood was glory glaucopis forsakes her own the angry gods forget us but yet the blue streams along walk the feet of the silver song and the night bird wakes the moon and the bees in the blushing noon haunt the heart of the old hymatus we are fallen but not forlorn if something is left to cherish as love was the earliest born so love is the last to perish four read then the roses read the beautiful still is ours while the streams still flow and the sky shall glow the beautiful still is ours whatever is fair or soft or bright in the lap of day or the arms of night whispers our soul of greece of greece and hushes our care with a voice of peace read then the roses wreathe they tell me of earlier hours and i hear the heart of my country breathe from the lips of the stranger's flowers end of book three chapter four book three chapter five of last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 3, Chapter 5. Nydia Encounters Julia. Interview of the Heathen Sister and Converted Brother. An Athenian's Notion of Christianity. What happiness to Ione! What bliss to be ever by the side of Glaucus, to hear his voice! And she too can see him! Such was the soliloquy of the blind girl, as she walked alone and at twilight to the house of her new mistress, whither Glaucus had already preceded her. Suddenly she was interrupted in her fond thoughts by a female voice. Blind girl, whither goest thou? There is no pannier under thine arm. Hast thou sold all thy flowers? The person thus accosting Nydia was a lady of a handsome but a bold and unmaidenly countenance. It was Julia, the daughter of Diomed. Her veil was half raised as she spoke. She was accompanied by Diomed himself, and by a slave carrying a lantern before them. The merchant and his daughter were returning home from a supper at one of their neighbors. Dost thou not remember my voice? continued Julia. I am the daughter of Diomed the wealthy. Ah, forgive me. Yes, I recall the tones of your voice. No, noble Julia, I have no flowers to sell. I heard that thou wert purchased by the beautiful Greek Glaucus. Is that true, pretty slave? asked Julia. I serve the Neapolitan Ione, replied Nydia evasively. Ah, and it is true, then... Come, come, interrupted Diomed, with his cloak up to his mouth. The night grows cold. I cannot stay here while you prate to that blind girl. Come, let her follow you home if you wish to speak to her. Do, child, said Julia, with the air of one not accustomed to be refused. I have much to ask of thee. Come. I cannot this night. It grows late, answered Nydia. I must be at home. I am not free, noble Julia. What, the meek Ione will chide thee? I, I doubt not she is a second Thalestris. But come, then, to-morrow. Do. Remember I have been thy friend of old. I will obey thy wishes, answered Nydia, and Diomed again impatiently summoned his daughter. She was obliged to proceed, with the main question she had desired to put to Nydia unasked. Meanwhile, we return to Ione. The interval of time that had elapsed that day between the first and second visit of Glaucus had not been too gaily spent she had received a visit from her brother since the night he had assisted in saving her from the egyptian she had not before seen him occupied with his own thoughts thoughts of so serious and intense a nature the young priest had thought little of his sister in truth men perhaps of that fervent order of mind which is ever aspiring above earth are but little prone to the earthlier affections and it had been long since Apacides had sought those soft and friendly interchanges of thought, those sweet confidences which in his earlier youth had bound him to Ione, and which are so natural to that endearing connection which existed between them. Ione, however, had not ceased to regret his estrangement. She had attributed it, at present, to the engrossing duties of his severe fraternity, and often, amidst all her bright hopes, and her new attachment to her betrothed, often, when she thought of her brother's brow prematurely furrowed, his unsmiling lip, and bended frame, she sighed to think that the service of the gods could throw so deep a shadow over that earth which the gods created. But this day, when he visited her, there was a strange calmness on his features, a more quiet and self-possessed expression in his sunken eyes, than she had marked for years. This apparent improvement was but momentary, it was a false calm which the least breeze could ruffle. May the gods bless thee, my brother, she said, embracing him. The gods, speak not thus vaguely, perchance there is but one god. My brother? What if the sublime faith of the Nazarene be true? What if God be a monarch, one, invisible, alone? What if these numerous countless deities whose altars fill the earth, be but evil demons seeking to wean us from the true creed this may be the case ione alas can we believe it or if we believed would it not be a melancholy faith answered the neapolitan what all this beautiful world made only human 
mountain disenchanted of its ored, the waters of their nymph, that beautiful prodigality of faith which makes everything divine, consecrating the meanest flowers, bearing celestial whispers in the faintest breeze, wouldst thou deny this and make the earth mere dust and clay? No, Apacides, all that is brightest in our hearts is that very credulity which peoples the universe with gods. Ione answered as a believer, in the posy of the old mythology would answer, we may judge by that reply how obstinate and hard the contest which Christianity had to endure among the heathens. The graceful superstition was never silent. Every, the most household, action of their lives was entwined with it. It was a portion of life itself, as the flowers are a part of the thyrsus. At every incident they recurred to a god. Every cup of wine was prefaced by a libation. The very garlands on their households were dedicated to some divinity. Their ancestors themselves, made holy, presided as lares over their hearth and hall. So abundant was belief with them, that in their own climes, at this hour, idolatry has never thoroughly been outrooted. It changes but its objects of worship. It appeals to innumerable saints where once it resorted to divinities, and it pours its crowds and listening reverence to oracles at the shrines of St. Januarius or St. Stephen, instead of those of Isis or Apollo. But these superstitions were not to the early Christians the object of contempt so much of as horror. They did not believe, with the quiet skepticism of the heathen philosopher, that the gods were inventions of the priest, nor even with the vulgar, that, according to the dim light of history, they had been mortals like themselves. They imagined the heathen divinities to be evil spirits. They transplanted to Italy and to Greece the gloomy demons of India and the East, and in Jupiter or in Mars they shuddered at the representative of Moloch or of Satan. Apacides had not yet adopted formally the Christian faith, but he was already on the brink of it. He already participated the doctrines of Olympus. He already imagined that the lively imaginations of the heathen were the suggestions of the arch enemy of mankind. The innocent and natural answer of Ione made him shudder. He hastened to reply vehemently, and yet so confusedly, that Ione feared for his reason more than she dreaded his violence. Ah, oh, my brother, she said, these hard duties of thine have shattered thy very sense. Come to me, Apacides, my brother, my own brother. Give me thy hand, let me wipe the dew from thy brow. Chide me not now, I understand thee not. Think only that Ione could not offend thee. Ione, said Apacides, drawing her towards him and regarding her tenderly, can I think that this beautiful form, this kind heart, may be destined to an eternity of torment? Dei Meliora, the gods forbid, said Ione, in the customary form of words by which her contemporaries thought an omen might be averted. The words, and still more the superstition they implied, wounded the ear of Apacides. He rose, muttering to himself, turned from the chamber, then stopping halfway, gazed wistfully on Ione, and extended his arms. Ione flew to them in joy. He kissed her earnestly, and then he said, Farewell, my sister. When we next meet, mayest thou be to me as nothing. Take thou, then, this embrace. Full yet of all the tender reminiscences of childhood, when faith and hope, creeds, customs, interests, objects, were the same to us. Now the tie is to be broken. With these strange words, he left the house. The great and severest trial of the primitive Christians was indeed this. Their conversion separated them from their dearest bonds. They could not associate with beings whose commonest actions, whose commonest forms of speech, were impregnated with idolatry. They shuddered at the blessings of love. To their ears it was uttered in a demon's name. This, their misfortune, was their strength. If it divided them from the rest of the world, it was to unite them proportionally to each other. They were men of iron who wrought forth the word of God, and verily the bonds that bound them were of iron also. Glaucus found Ione in tears. He had already assumed the sweet privilege to console. He drew from her a recital of her interview with her brother. But in her confused account of language, itself so confused to one not prepared for it, he was equally at a loss with Ione to conceive the intentions or the meaning of Apacides. Hast thou ever heard much, she asked, of this new sect of the Nazarenes, 
of which my brother spoke? I have often heard enough of the votaries, replied Glaucus, but of their exact tenets I know not, save that their doctrine there seemeth something preternaturally chilling and morose. They live apart from their kind. They affect to be shocked even at our simple uses of garlands. They have no sympathies with the cheerful amusements of life. They utter awful threats of the coming destruction of the world. They appear, in one word, to have brought their unsmiling and gloomy creed out of the cave of Trophonius. Yet, continued Glaucus, after a slight pause, they have not wanted men of great power and genius, nor converts, even among the Aeropagites of Athens. Well do I remember to have heard my father speak of one strange guest at Athens many years ago. Methinks his name was Paul. My father was amongst a mighty crowd that gathered on one of our immemorial hills to hear this sage of the East expound. Through the wide throng there rang not a single murmur. The jest and the roar, with which our native orators are received, were hushed for him. And when on the loftiest summit of that hill, raised above the breathless crowd below, stood this mysterious visitor, his mien and his countenance awed every heart, even before a sound left his lips. He was a man, I have heard my father say, of no tall stature, but of noble and impressive mien. His robes were dark and ample. The declining sun, for it was evening, shone aslant upon his form as it rose aloft, motionless and commanding. His countenance was much worn and marked, as of one who had braved alike misfortune and the sternest vicissitude of many climes but his eyes were bright with an almost unearthly fire, and when he raised his arm to speak, it was with the majesty of a man into whom the spirit of a god hath rushed. Men of Athens, he is reported to have said, I find amongst ye an altar with this inscription, To the unknown god, ye worship in ignorance the same deity I serve. To you unknown till now, to you be it now revealed." then declared that solemn man how this great maker of all things who had appointed unto man his several tribes and his various homes the lord of earth and the universal heaven dwelt not in temples made with hands that his presence his spirit were in the air we breathed our life and our being were with him think you he cried that the invisible is like your statues of gold and marble think you that he needeth sacrifice from you he who made heaven and earth? Then he spoke of fearful and coming times, of the end of the world, of a second rising of the dead, whereof an assurance had been given to man in the resurrection of the mighty being whose religion he came to preach. When he thus spoke, the long-pent murmur went forth, and the philosophers that were mingled with the people muttered their sage contempt. There might you have seen the chilling frown of the Stoic, and the cynic's sneer, and the Epicurean, who believeth not even in our own Elysium, muttered a pleasant jest, and swept laughing through the crowd, but the deep heart of the people was touched and thrilled, and they trembled, though they knew not why, for verily the stranger had the voice and majesty of a man to whom the unknown God had committed the preaching of his faith. Ione listened with rapt attention, and the serious and earnest manner of the narrator betrayed the impression that he himself had received from one who had been amongst the audience, that on the hill of the heathen Mars had heard the first tidings of the word of Christ. End of Book 3, Chapter 5three chapter six of last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anne boulet last days of pompeii by edward g bulwer lighton book three chapter six the porter the girl and the gladiator the door of Diomed's house stood open, and Medan, the old slave, sat at the bottom of the steps by which you ascended to the mansion. That luxurious mansion of the rich merchant of Pompeii is still to be seen just without the gates of the city, at the commencement of the street of tombs. It was a gay neighborhood, despite the dead. On the opposite side, but at some yards nearer the gate, was a spacious hostelry, at which those brought by business or by pleasure to Pompeii 
often stopped to refresh themselves. In the space before the entrance of the inn now stood wagons and carts and chariots, some just arrived, some just quitting, in all the bustle of an animated and popular resort of public entertainment. Before the door, some farmers, seated on a bench by a small circular table, were talking over their morning cups, on the affairs of their calling. On the side of the door itself was painted gaily and freshly the eternal sign of the checkers. By the roof of the inn stretched a terrace, on which some females, wives of the farmers above mentioned, were, some seated, some leaning over the railing, and conversing with their friends below. In a deep recess, at a little distance, was a covered seat, in which some two or three poorer travellers were resting themselves, and shaking the dust from their garments. On the other side stretched a wide space, originally the burial ground of a more ancient race than the present desidens of Pompeii, and now converted into a eustrinum, or place for the burning of the dead. Above this rose the terraces of a gay villa, half hid by trees. The tombs themselves, with their graceful and varied shapes, the flowers and the foliage that surrounded them, made no melancholy feature in the prospect. Hard by the gate of the city, in a small niche, stood the still form of the well-disciplined Roman sentry, the sun shining brightly on his polished crest and the lance on which he leaned. The gate itself was divided into three arches, the center one for vehicles, the others for foot passengers and on either side rose the mass of walls which girt the city, composed, patched, repaired at a thousand different epochs, according as war, time, or the earthquake had shattered that vain protection. At frequent intervals rose square towers, whose summits broke in a picturesque rudeness the regular line of the wall, and contrasted well with the modern buildings gleaming whitely by. The curving road, which in that direction leads from Pompeii to Herculaneum, wound out of sight amidst hanging vines, above which frowned the sullen majesty of Vesuvius. Hast thou heard the news, old Medan? said a young woman, with a pitcher in her hand, as she paused by Diomed's door to gossip a moment with the slave, ere she repaired to the neighboring inn to fill the vessel, and coquette with the travelers. News? What news? said the slave, raising his eyes moodily from the ground. Why, there passed through the gate this morning, no doubt ere thou wert well awake, such a visitor to Pompeii. Ay, said the slave indifferently. Yes, a present from the noble Pomponianus. A present? I thought thou sayest a visitor. It is both visitor and present. No, O oh, dull and stupid, that it is a most beautiful young tiger for our approaching games in the amphitheater. Hear you that, Medan? Oh, what pleasure! I declare I shall not sleep a wink till I see it. They say it has such a roar. Poor fool, said Medan, sadly and cynically. Fool? Me no fool, old cur. It is a pretty thing, a tiger, especially if we could but find somebody for him to eat. We have now a lion and a tiger. Only consider that, Medan and for want of two good criminals, perhaps, we shall be forced to see them eat each other. By the by, your son is a gladiator, a handsome man and a strong. Can you not persuade him to fight the tiger? Do now. You would oblige me mightily. Nay, you would be a benefactor to the whole town. Va, va, said the slave, with great asperity. Think of thine own danger, ere thou thus prattest of my poor boy's death. My own danger, said the girl, frightened and looking hastily around. Avert the omen. Let thy words fall on thine own head. And the girl, as she spoke, touched a talisman suspended round her neck. Thine own danger. What danger threatens me? Had the earthquake but a few nights since no warning, said Medan, has it not a voice? Did it not say to us all, prepare for death, the end of all things is at hand? Bah, stuff, said the young woman, settling the folds of her tunic. Now thou talkest as they say the Nazarenes talked. Methinks thou art one of them. Well, I can prat with thee, gray croaker, no more. Thou growest worse and worse. Vale, O oh, Hercules, send us a man for the lion, and another for the tiger. Ho, ho, for the merry, merry show, with a forest of faces in every row. 
lo the swordsman bold as the son of alcmena sweep side by side o'er the hushed arena talk while you may you will hold your breath when they meet in the grasp of the glowing death tramp tramp how gaily they go ho ho for the merry merry show chanting in a silver and clear voice this feminine ditty and holding up her tunic from the dusty road the young woman stepped lightly across the crowded hostelry my poor son said the slave half aloud is it for things like this thou art to be butchered o oh, faith of christ i could worship thee in all sincerity were it but for the horror which thou inspirest for these bloody lists the old man's head sank dejectedly on his breast he remained silent and absorbed but every now and then with the corner of his sleeve he wiped his eyes his heart was with his son he did not see the figure that now approached from the gate with a quick step and a somewhat fierce and reckless gait and carriage he did not lift his eyes till the figure paused opposite the place where he sat and with a soft voice addressed him by the name of father my boy my leyden is it indeed thou said the old man joyfully oh thou wert present to my thoughts i am glad to hear it my father said the gladiator respectfully touching the knees and the beard of the slave and soon may i be always present with thee not in thought only yes my son but not in this world replied the slave mournfully talk not thus o oh my sire look cheerfully for i feel so i am sure that i shall win the day and then the gold i gain buys thy freedom oh father it was but a few days since that i was taunted by one too whom i would gladly have undeceived for he is more generous than the rest of his equals he is not roman he is of athens by him i was taunted with the lust of gain when i demanded what sum was the prize of victory alas he knew little of the soul of leyden my boy my boy said the old slave as slowly ascending the steps he conducted his son to his own little chamber communicating with the entrance hall which in this villa was the peristyle not the atrium you may see it now it is the third floor to the right on entering the first door conducts to the staircase the second is but a false recess in which there stood a statue of bronze generous affectionate pious are thy motives said medon when they were thus secured from observation thy deed itself is guilt thou art to risk thy blood for thy father's freedom that might be forgiven but the price of victory is the blood of another oh that is a deadly sin no object can purify it forbear forbear rather would i be a slave for ever than purchase liberty on such terms hush my father replied leyden somewhat impatiently thou hast picked up in this new creed of thine of which i pray thee not to speak to me for the gods that gave me strength denied me wisdom and i understand not one word of what thou often preachest to me thou hast picked up i say in this new creed some singular fantasies of right and wrong pardon me if i offend thee but reflect against whom shall i contend oh couldst thou know those wretches with whom for thy sake i assort thou wouldst think i purified earth by removing one of them beasts whose very lips drop blood things all savage undisciplined in their very courage ferocious heartless senseless no tie of life can bind them they know not fear it is true but neither know they gratitude nor charity nor love they are made but for their own career to slaughter without pity to die without dread can thy gods whosoever they be look with wrath on a conflict with such as these and in such a cause o oh, my father wherever the powers above gaze down on the earth they behold no duty so sacred so sanctifying as the sacrifice offered to an aged parent by the piety of a grateful son the poor old slave himself deprived of the lights of knowledge and only late a convert to the christian faith knew not with what arguments to enlighten an ignorance at once so dark and yet so beautiful in its error his first impulse was to throw himself on his son's breast his next to start away to wring his hands and in the attempt to reprove his broken voice lost itself in weeping and if resumed leyden if thy deity methinks thou wilt own but one be indeed that benevolent and pitying power which thou assertest him to be he will know also that thy very faith in him first confirmed me in that determination thou blamest 
How, what mean you? said the slave. Why, thou knowest that I, sold in my childhood as a slave, was set free at Rome by the will of my master, whom I had been fortunate enough to please. I hastened to Pompeii to see thee. I found thee already aged and infirm, under the yoke of a capricious and pampered lord. Thou hast lately adopted this new faith, and its adoption made thy slavery doubly painful to thee. It took away all the softening charm of custom, which reconciles us so often to the worst. Didst thou not complain to me that thou wert compelled to offices that were not odious to thee as a slave, but guilty as a Nazarene? Didst thou not tell me that thy soul shook with remorse, when thou wert compelled to place even a crumb of cake before the lares that watch over yon impluvium, that thy soul was torn by a perpetual struggle? Didst thou not tell me that even by pouring wine before the threshold, and calling on the name of some Grecian deity, thou didst fear that thou wert incurring penalties worse than those of Tantalus, an eternity of tortures more terrible than those of the Tartarian fields? Didst thou not tell me this? I wondered, I could not comprehend, nor, by Hercules, could I now, but I was thy son, and my sole task was to compassionate and to relieve. Could I hear thy groans, could I witness thy mysterious horrors, thy constant anguish, and remain inactive? No, by the immortal gods, the thought struck me like light from Olympus. I had no money, but I had strength and youth. These were thy gifts. I could sell these in my turn for thee. I learned the amount of thy ransom. I learned that the usual prize of a victorious gladiator would doubly pay it. I became a gladiator. I linked myself with those accursed men, scorning, loathing, while I joined. I acquired their skill. Blessed be the lesson. It shall teach me to free my father. Oh, that thou couldst hear Olynthus, sighed the old man, more and more affected by the virtue of his son, but not less strongly convinced of the criminality of his purpose. I will hear the whole world talk if thou wilt, answered the gladiator gaily, but not till thou art a slave no more. Beneath thy own roof, my father, thou shalt puzzle this dull brain all day long, aye, and all night too, if it give thee pleasure. Oh, such a spot as I have chalked out for thee. It is one of the nine hundred and ninety-nine shops of the old Julia Felix, in the sunny part of the city, where thou mayest bask before the door in the day, and I will sell the oil and the wine for thee, my father. And then, please Venus, or if it does not please her, since thou lovest not her name, it is all one to Leiden. Then I say, perhaps thou mayest have a daughter, too, to tend thy gray hairs, and hear shrill voices at thy knee, that shall call thee Leiden's father. Ah, we shall be so happy, the prize can purchase all. Cheer thee, cheer up, my sire, and now I must away, day wears. The Lanista waits me. Come, thy blessing. As Leiden thus spoke, he had already quitted the dark chamber of his father, and speaking eagerly, though in a whispered tone, they now stood at the same place in which we introduced the porter at his post. Oh, bless thee, bless thee, my brave boy, said Medan fervently, and may the great power that reads all hearts see the nobleness of thine, and forgive its error. The tall shape of the gladiator passed swiftly down the path, the eyes of the slave followed its light but stately steps, till the last glimpse was gone, and then, sinking once more on his seat, his eyes again fastened themselves on the ground. His form, mute and unmoving, as a thing of stone. His heart, who, in our happier age, can even imagine its struggles, its commotion. May I enter? said a sweet voice. Is thy mistress Julia within? The slave mechanically motioned to the visitor to enter, but she who addressed him could not see the gesture. She repeated her question timidly, but in a louder voice. Have I not told thee, said the slave peevishly, enter. Thanks, said the speaker plaintively, and the slave, roused by the tone, looked up and recognized the blind flower girl. Sorrow can sympathize with affliction. He raised himself and guided her steps to the head of the adjacent staircase, by which you descended to Julia's apartment, where, summoning a female slave, he consigned her to the charge of the blind girl. End of Book 3, Chapter 6
Book three, chapter seven of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book three, chapter seven. The dressing room of a Pompeian beauty. Important conversation between Julia and Nydia. The elegant Julia sat in her chamber, with her slaves around her. Like the cubiculum which adjoined it, the room was small, but much larger than the usual apartments appropriated to sleep, which were so diminutive that few who have ever not seen the bedchambers, even in the gayest mansions, can form any notion of the petty pigeonholes in which the citizens of Pompeii evidently thought it desirable to pass the night but in fact bed with the ancients was not that grave serious and important part of domestic mysteries which it is with us the couch itself was more like a very narrow and small sofa light enough to be transported easily and by the occupant himself from place to place and it was no doubt constantly shifted from chamber to chamber according to the caprice of the inmate or the changes of the season for that side of the house which was crowded in one month might perhaps be carefully avoided in the next there was also among the italians of that period a singular and fastidious apprehension of too much daylight their darkened chambers which first appear to us the result of a negligent architecture were the effect of the most elaborate study in their porticos and gardens they courted the sun whenever it so pleased their luxurious tastes in the interior of their houses they sought rather the coolness and the shade Julia's apartment at that season was in the lower part of the house, immediately beneath the state rooms above, and looking upon the garden, with which it was on a level. The wide door, which was glazed, alone admitted the morning rays, yet her eye, accustomed to a certain darkness, was sufficiently acute to perceive exactly what colors were the most becoming. What shade of the delicate rouge gave the brightest beam to her dark glance, and the most youthful freshness to her cheek? on the table before which she sat was a small and circular mirror of the most polished steel round which in precise order were arranged the cosmetics and unguents the perfumes and the paints the jewels and combs the ribbons and the gold pins which were destined to add to the natural attractions of beauty the assistance of art and the capricious allurements of fashion through the dimness of the room glowed brightly the vivid and various colorings of the wall in all the dazzling frescoes of Pompeian taste. Before the dressing table, and under the feet of Julia, was spread a carpet, woven from the looms of the east. Near at hand, on another table, was a silver basin and ewer, an extinguished lamp of most exquisite workmanship, in which the artist had represented a cupid reposing under the spreading branches of a myrtle tree, and a small roll of papyrus, containing the softest elegies of Tibullus, before the door which communicated with the cubiculum hung a curtain richly broidered with gold flowers such was the dressing room of a beauty eighteen centuries ago the fair julia leaned indolently back on her seat while the ornatrix i e hairdresser slowly piled one above the other a mass of small curls dexterously weaving the false with the true and carrying the whole fabric to a height that seemed to place the head rather at the centre than the summit of the human form her tunic of a deep amber which well set off her dark hair and somewhat in brown complexion swept in ample folds to her feet which were cased in slippers fastened round the slender ankle by white thongs while a profusion of pearls were embroidered in the slipper itself which was of purple and turned slightly upward as do the turkish slippers at this day an old slave skilled by long experience in the arcana of the toilet stood beside the hairdresser with the broad and studded girdle of her mistress over her arm and giving from time to time mingled with judicious flattery to the lady herself instructions to the mason of the ascending pile put that pin rather more to the right lower stupid one do you not observe how even those beautiful eyebrows are you would think you were dressing carina whose face is all of one side now put in the flowers what fool not that dull pink you are not suiting the colors to the dim cheeks of chloris 
It must be the brightest flowers that can alone suit the cheek of the young Julia. Gently, said the lady, stamping her foot violently. You pull my hair as if you were plucking a weed. Dull thing, continued the directress of the ceremony. Do you not know how delicate is your mistress? You are not dressing the coarse horsehair of the widow Fulvia. Now then, the ribbon, that's right. Fair Julia, look in the mirror. Saw you ever anything so lovely as yourself? When, after numerable comments, difficulties, and delays, the intricate tower was at length completed. The next preparation was that of giving to the eyes the soft languish, produced by a dark powder applied to the lids and brows. A small patch cut in the form of a crescent, skillfully placed by the rosy lips, attracted attention to their dimples, and to the teeth, to which already every art had been applied in order to heighten the dazzle of their natural whiteness. To another slave, hitherto idle, was now consigned the charge of arranging the jewels, the earrings of pearl, two to each ear, the massive bracelets of gold, the chain formed of rings of the same metal, to which a talisman cut in crystals was attached, the graceful buckle on the left shoulder, in which was set an exquisite cameo of Psyche, the girdle of purple ribbon, richly wrought with threads of gold and clasped by interlacing serpents, and lastly the various rings, fitted to every joint of the white and slender fingers. The toilet was now arranged according to the last mode of Rome. The fair Julia regarded herself with a last gaze of complacent vanity, and reclining again upon her seat, she bade the youngest of her slaves, in a listless tone, to read to her the enamored couplets of Tibullus. This lecture was still preceding, when a female slave admitted Nydia into the presence of the lady of the place. Salve, Julia, said the flower girl, arresting her steps within a few paces from the spot where Julia sat, and crossing her arms upon her breast. I have obeyed your commands. You have done well, flower girl, answered the lady. Approach, you may take a seat. One of the slaves placed a stool by Julia, and Nydia seated herself. Julia looked hard at the Thessalian for some moments, in rather an embarrassed silence. She then motioned her attendants to withdraw, and to close the door. When they were alone, she said, looking mechanically at Nydia, and forgetting that she was with one who could not observe her countenance. You serve the Neapolitan Ione? I am with her at present, answered Nydia. Is she as handsome as they say? I know not, replied Nydia. How can I judge? Ah, I should have remembered, but thou hast ears, if not eyes. Do thy fellow slaves tell thee she is handsome? Slaves talking with one another forget to flatter even their mistress. They tell me that she is beautiful. Hm! They say that she is tall? Yes. Why, so am I. Dark-haired? I have heard so. So am I. And doth Glaucus visit her much? Daily, replied Nydia with a half-suppressed sigh. Daily, indeed. Does he find her handsome? I should think so, since they are soon to be wedded. Wedded, cried Julia, turning pale even through the false roses on her cheek, and starting from her couch. Nydia did not, of course, perceive the emotion she had caused. Julia remained a long time silent, but her heaving breast and flashing eyes would have betrayed, to one who could have seen, the wound her vanity had sustained. They tell me thou art a Thessalian, she said, at last breaking silence. And truly, Thessaly is a land of magic and of witches, of talisman and of love filters, said Julia. It has ever been celebrated for its sorcerers, returned Nydia timidly. Knowest thou, then, blind Thessalian, of any love charms? I, said the flower girl, coloring. I? How should I? No, assuredly not. The worse for thee. I could have given thee gold enough to purchase thy freedom, hadst thou been more wise. But what, asked Nydia, can induce the beautiful and wealthy Julia to ask that question of her servant? Has she not money and youth and loveliness? Are they not love charms enough to dispense with magic? To all but one person in the world, answered Julia haughtily. But methinks thy blindness is infectious and... But no matter. And that one person, said Nydia eagerly, is not Glaucus, replied Julia with the customary deceit of her sex. Glaucus? No. 
Nadia drew her breath more freely, and after a short pause, Julia recommenced. But talking of Glaucus, and his attachment to this Neapolitan, reminded me of the influence of love spells which, for I ought no or care, she may have exercised upon him. Blind girl, I love, and, shall Julia live to say it, am love not in return. This humbles, nay, not humbles, but it stings my pride. I would see this ingrate at my feet, not in order that I might raise, but that I might spurn him. When they told me thou wert Thessalian, I imagined thy young mind might have learned the dark secrets of thy climb. Alas, no, murmured Nydia, would it had. Thanks, at least for that kindly wish, said Julia, unconscious of what was passing in the breast of the flower girl. But tell me, thou heardest the gossip of slaves, always prone to these dim beliefs, always ready to apply sorcery for their own low loves. Hast thou ever heard of an eastern magician in this city, who possesses the art of which thou art ignorant? No vain chiromancer, no juggler of the marketplace, but some more potent and mighty magician of India, or of Egypt? Uh, of Egypt? Yes, said Nydia, shuddering. What Pompeian has not heard of Arbaces? Arbaces? True, replied Julia, grasping at the recollection. They say he is a man above all the petty and false impostures of dull pretenders, that he is versed in the learning of the stars, and the secrets of the ancient Knox. Why not in the mysteries of love? If there be one magician living whose art is above that of others, it is that dread man, answered Nydia, and she felt her talisman while she spoke. Is he too wealthy to divine for money? continued Julia, sneeringly. Can I not visit him? It is an evil mansion for the young and the beautiful, replied Nydia. I have heard, too, that he languishes in... An evil mansion, said Julia, catching only the first sentence. Why so? The orgies of his midnight leisure are impure and polluted, at least so says rumor. By Ceres, by Pan, by Sibylle, thou dost but provoke my curiosity, instead of exciting my fears, returned the wayward and pampered Pompeian. I will seek and question of his lore. If to these orgies love be admitted, why, the more likely he knows its secrets. Nydia did not answer. I will seek him this very day, resumed Julia. Nay, why not this very hour? At daylight, and in his present state, thou hast assuredly the less to fear, answered Nydia, yielding to her own sudden and secret wish to learn if the dark Egyptian were indeed possessed of those spells to rivet and attract love, of which the Thessalian had so often heard. And who dare insult the rich daughter of Diomed? said Julia haughtily. I will go. May I visit thee afterwards to learn the result? asked Nydia anxiously. Kiss me for thy interest in Julia's honor, answered the lady. Yes, assuredly. This eve we sup abroad. Come hither at the same hour to-morrow, and thou shalt know all. I may have to employ thee too, but enough for the present. Stay, take this bracelet for the new thought thou hast inspired me with. Remember, if thou servest Julia, she is grateful and she is generous. I cannot take thy present, said Nydia, putting aside the bracelet. But young as I am, I can sympathize unbought with those who love, and love in vain. Sayest thou so, returned Julia. Thou speakest like a free woman, and thou shalt yet be free. Farewell. End of Book 3, Chapter 7《Chapter 8 of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 3, Chapter 8 Julia Seeks Arbaces. The Results of That Interview. Arbaces was seated in a chamber which opened on a kind of balcony or portico that fronted his garden. His cheek was pale and worn with the sufferings he had endured, but his iron frame had already recovered from the severest effects of that accident which had frustrated his fell designs in the moment of victory. 
the air that came fragrantly to his brow revived his languid senses and the blood circulated more freely than it had done for days through his shrunken veins so then he thought the storm of fate has broken and blown over the evil which my lore predicted threatening life itself has chanced and yet i live it came as the stars foretold and now the long bright and prosperous career which was to succeed that evil if i survived it smiles beyond i have passed i have subdued the latest danger of my destiny now i have but to lay out the gardens of my future fate unterrified and secure first then of all my pleasures even before that of love shall come revenge this greek boy who has crossed my passion thwarted my designs baffled me even when the blade was about to drink his accursed blood shall not a second time escape me but for the method of my vengeance of that let me ponder well o oh, ate if thou art indeed a goddess fill me with thy direst inspiration the egyptian sank into an intent reverie which did not seem to present to him any clear or satisfactory suggestions he changed his position restlessly as he revolved scheme after scheme which no sooner occurred than it was dismissed several times he struck his breast and groaned aloud with the desire of vengeance and a sense of his impotence to accomplish it while thus absorbed a boy slave timidly entered the chamber a female evidently of rank from her dress and that of the single slave who attended her waited below and sought an audience with our bases a female his heart beat quick is she young her face is concealed by her veil but her form is slight yet round as that of youth admit her said the egyptian for a moment his vain heart dreamed the stranger might be ione the first glance of the visitor now entering the apartment sufficed to undeceive so erring a fancy true she was about the same height as ione and perhaps the same age true she was finely and richly formed but where was that undulating and ineffable grace which accompanied every motion of that peerless neapolitan the chaste and decorous garb so simple even in the care of its arrangement the dignified yet bashful step the majesty of womanhood and its modesty pardon me that i rise with pain said arbaces gazing at the stranger i am still suffering from recent illness do not disturb thyself o great egyptian returned julia seeking to disguise the fear she already experienced beneath the ready resort of flattery and forgive an unfortunate female who seeks consolation from thy wisdom draw near fair stranger said arbaces and speak without apprehension or reserve julia placed herself on a seat beside the egyptian and wonderingly gazed around an apartment whose elaborate and costly luxuries shamed even the ornate enrichment of her father's mansion fearfully too she regarded the hieroglyphical inscriptions on the walls the faces of the mysterious images which at every corner gazed upon her the tripod at a little distance and above all the grave and remarkable countenance of arbaces himself a long white robe like a veil half covered his raven locks and flowed to his feet his face was made even more impressive by its present paleness and his dark and penetrating eyes seemed to pierce the shelter of her veil and explore the secrets of her vain and unfeminine soul and what said his low deep voice brings thee o oh maiden to the house of the eastern stranger his fame replied julia in what he said with a strange and slight smile canst thou ask o oh wise arbaces is not thy knowledge the very gossip theme of pompeii some little lore i have indeed treasured up replied arbaces but in what can such serious and sterile secrets benefit the ear of beauty alas said julia a little cheered by the accustomed accents of adulation does not sorrow fly to wisdom for relief and they who love unrequitedly are not they the chosen victims of grief 
Ha! said Arbaces, can unrequited love be the lot of so fair a form, whose model proportions are visible even beneath the folds of thy graceful robe? Deign, O maiden, to lift thy veil, that I may see, at least, if the face correspond in loveliness with the form. Not unwilling, perhaps, to exhibit her charms, and thinking they were likely to interest the magician in her fate, Julia, after some slight hesitation, raised her veil, and revealed a beauty which, but for art, had been indeed attractive to the fixed gaze of the Egyptian. Thou comest to me for advice in unhappy love, he said. Well, turn that face on the ungrateful one. What other love charm can I give thee? Oh, cease these courtesies, said Julia. It is a love charm, indeed, that I would ask from thy skill. Fair stranger, replied Arbaces, somewhat scornfully. Love spells are not among the secrets I have wasted the midnight oil to attain. Is it indeed so? Then pardon me, great Arbaces and farewell. Stay, said Arbaces, who, despite his passion for Ione, was not unmoved by the beauty of his visitor, and had he been in the flush of a more assured health, might have attempted to console the fair Julia by other means than those of supernatural wisdom. Stay, although I confess that I have left the witchery of filters and potions to those whose trade is in such knowledge, yet i am myself not so dull to beauty but that in earlier youth i may have employed them in my own behalf i may give thee advice at least if thou wilt be candid with me tell me then first art thou unmarried as thy dress betokens yes said julia and being unblessed with fortune wouldst thou allure some wealthy suitor i am richer than he who disdains me strange and more strange and thou lovest him who loves not thee i know not if i love him answered julia haughtily but i know that i would see myself triumph over a rival i would see him who rejected me my suitor i would see her whom he has preferred in her turn despised a natural ambition and a womanly said the egyptian in a tone too grave for irony yet more fair maiden wilt thou confide to me the name of thy lover can he be pompeian and despise wealth even if blind to beauty he is of athens answered julia looking down ha huh! cried the egyptian impetuously as the blood rushed to his cheek there is but one athenian young and noble in pompeii can it be glaucus of whom thou speakest ah betray me not so indeed they call him the egyptian sank back gazing vacantly on the averted face of the merchant's daughter and muttering inly to himself this conference with which he had hitherto only trifled amusing himself with the credulity and vanity of his visitor might it not minister to his revenge i see thou canst assist me not said julia offended by his continued silence guard at least my secret once more farewell maiden said the egyptian in an earnest and serious tone thy suit hath touched me i will minister to thy will listen to me i have not myself dabbled in these lesser mysteries but i know one who hath at the base of vesuvius less than a league from the city there dwells a powerful witch beneath the rank dews of the new moon she has gathered the herbs which possess the virtue to chain love in eternal fetters her art can bring thy lover to thy feet. Seek her, and mention to her the name of Arbaces. She fears that name, and will give thee her most potent filters. Alas, answered Julia, I know not the road to the home of her whom thou speakest of. The way, short though it be, is long to traverse for a girl who leaves, unknown, the house of her father. The country is entangled with wild vines, and dangerous with precipitous caverns. I dare not trust to mere strangers to guide me. The reputation of women of my rank is easily tarnished, and though I care not who knows that I love Glaucus, I would not have it imagined that I obtained his love by a spell. Were I but three days advanced in health, said the Egyptian, rising and walking, as if to try his strength across the chamber, but with irregular and feeble steps, 
I myself would accompany thee. Well, thou must wait. But Glaucus is soon to wed the hated Neapolitan. Wed? Yes, in the early part of next month. So soon? Art thou well advised of this? From the lips of her own slave. It shall not be, said the Egyptian impetuously. Fear nothing, Glaucus shall be thine. Yet how, when thou obtainest it, canst thou administer to him this potion? My father has invited him, and, I believe, the Neapolitan also, to a banquet on the day following tomorrow. I shall then have the opportunity to administer it. So be it, said the Egyptian, with eyes flashing such fierce joy that Julia's gaze sank trembling beneath them. Tomorrow eve, then, order thy litter. Thou hast one at thy command. Surely, yes, returned the purse-proud Julia. Order thy litter. At two miles distance from the city is a house of entertainment, frequented by the wealthier Pompeians, from the excellence of its baths and the beauty of its gardens. There canst thou pretend only to shape thy course. There, ill or dying, I will meet thee by the statue of Salinas, in the copse that skirts the garden, and I myself will guide thee to the witch. Let us wait till, with the evening star, the goats of the herdsmen are gone to rest, when the dark twilight conceals us, and none shall cross our steps. Go home and fear not. By Hades, swears Arbaces, the sorcerer of Egypt, that Ione shall never wed with Glaucus. And that Glaucus shall be mine, added Julia, filling up the incomplete sentence. Thou hast said it, replied Arbaces, and Julia, half frightened at this unhallowed appointment, but urged on by jealousy and the peak of rivalship, even more than love, resolved to fulfill it. Left alone, our bases burst forth. Bright stars that never lie, ye already begin the execution of your promises, success in love, and victory over foes, for the rest of my smooth existence. In the very hour when my mind could devise no clue to the goal of vengeance, have ye sent this fair fool for my guide? He paused in deep thought. Yes, he said again, but in a calmer voice, I could not myself have given to her the poison that shall indeed be a filter. His death might be thus tracked to my door, but the witch, ay, there is the fit, the natural agent of my designs. He summoned one of his slaves, bade him hasten to track the steps of Julia, and acquaint himself with her name and condition. This done, he stepped forth into the portico. The skies were serene and clear, but he, deeply read in the signs of various change, beheld in one mass of cloud, far on the horizon, which the wind began slowly to agitate, that a storm was brooding above. It is like my vengeance, he said, as he gazed. The sky is clear, but the cloud moves on. End of Book 3, Chapter 8